of the Salish Sea's biggest mysteries has been why a small number of gray whales began detouring way off their migration route to come here, so close to land that they scraped their bellies on our beaches. What could possibly be worth these huge and very hungry whales swimming this far off course? Mm. No matter how long it takes, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. Whalers called gray whales devilfish because of how fiercely they fought back when harpooned, especially if their calves were threatened. We dared a visit to these hellions into the very darkest heart of their breeding grounds. Look out! It's a devilfish, and she's coming right for us! Abandon all hope and prepare to meet your maker! <laughs> Actually, prepare to meet what we now know is a curious, intelligent, and wonderfully social being. One that seeks out and even appears to enjoy human contact. <laughs> Seems they're not so devilish after all, as long as you're not poking their calves with spears. These lovable leviathans spend their winters in the warm, shallow lagoons of Baja, Mexico, where the boys and girls hook up and pregnant mamas give birth. New moms with calves linger here the longest so that their big babies can pack on the pounds before heading off to colder waters. This pickle-headed cutie was born at 15 feet long and weighed a ton. But by the time she's weaned off her mother's ultra-fatty milk at eight months old, she'll be twice that length and eight times the mass. She'll eventually weigh in around the same 90,000 pounds as her mom. Ever since whaling ended, these lagoons have reverted to a gray whale paradise. You wonder, why don't they just stay in Mexico all year? It's because these ballenas gigantes need vast amounts of metabolic fuel. They've evolved to make a momentous move north to take advantage of the bloom of life that occurs each summer in more productive northern waters. This is the Earth's most magnificent mammal migration. In recent years, when their populations hit a peak, collectively, more than a million tons of gray whale travel back and forth from Baja to the Arctic Ocean. That's the equivalent of swimming from New York to Los Angeles. Round trip, not once, but twice. This epic journey is not without risk. Because mothers with new calves are the last to leave the breeding grounds, they're on their own against wolf packs of killer whales. These mammal hunting types of orca are the sea's ultimate predator. No prey is too large for them when they hunt in groups, and they've learned to patrol back and forth across the gray whale's migration route. One of their favorite ambush spots is off Monterey Bay, California. Some gray mothers hug the shoreline of the bay. They know that killer whales often attack large animals by ramming them, hoping to cause internal injuries. If the grays can keep to the shallows, it helps protect their vulnerable bellies. Sometimes a gray whale mother can successfully fight off the orcas or help her calf run into the safer shallows. Other times, she can't. Killer whales need to feed their families too. Dodging gauntlets of hungry orcas is a natural part of life and death for gray whales, but it's far from their most serious threat. After a remarkable comeback from near extinction, Eastern Pacific gray whales have suffered several of what scientists blandly call UMEs, unusual mortality events. It's our geeky, non-emotional Klingon way of saying that thousands of these animals have died within a short period of time. The most recent UME finally ended in the winter of 2023, but it's been a rough one. Scientists estimate that since their peak in 2015, nearly half of all the gray whales have died, slashing their numbers from a post-whaling record high of 27,000. Too many of these deaths were from ship strikes and entanglements, but the majority are due to how our climate is changing. Shifts in sea ice coverage, currents, and within the populations of plankton, fish, and bottom-dwelling creatures are causing complex changes in the ecosystem that we're racing to understand. To the whales, 
Specific answers don't matter. For them, it's simple. If they can't find enough food each summer, then they won't survive the year. And finally tonight here, a remarkable sighting off the coast of Massachusetts. Just weeks before we recorded this episode, a Pacific gray whale was spotted in the Atlantic Ocean. This pioneering whale swam along one of climate change's few silver linings by navigating an increasingly ice-free Northwest Passage. Not to take anything away from this brave pilgrim, but scientists believe that he and a few others who made the trip before him fattened up in the Arctic's Bering Sea before munching their way across the top of the world. A more puzzling feat much closer to home is why a tiny number of Pacific Greys, at very near the end of their energy reserves, repeatedly choose to make a hard right turn far south of the Arctic feeding grounds and swim a minimum of an extra 300 miles on a visit inside the Salish Sea. We're out with scientists from Cascadia Research. These whale experts work all over the Pacific Ocean, but we're here today because they found something fascinating in their own backyard. Senior biologist John Kalambakitas is a world-class expert on everything from diminutive harbor porpoises to gargantuan blue whales. To have the case of the wandering whales swim right up to his doorstep in Puget Sound was a most fortunate fluke. They've been researching this mystery since back when the small number of off-course greys became so well known to Puget Sound locals that they started calling them the Sounders. Also on board with us are James Fallbush, Cascadia's tagging specialist, and Hannah Clayton, whose research includes analyzing gray whale behavior. Both Hannah and James are working on their PhDs at Stanford. So my plan is to sit back and eat snacks while letting them do all the heavy thinking. Something about these gray whales is making me even hungrier than usual. We barely motored out of Everett and into Possession Sound when John tells us to start scanning for blows. This seems way too shallow to find a whale the size of a greyhound bus. Sure enough, there's the telltale mist amidst the choppy waves. There are at least two gray whales here. Over the years, the Sounders have grown to 20 whales that Cascadia has cataloged. That's only about 0.14% of the entire North Pacific gray whale population. These are big animals. Their gray skin is covered in blotches, scrapes, and scars and barnacles. It's as if a stretch of our rocky, rugged coastline has come to life and started swimming around. These awesome tails can be 10 to 12 feet wide, graceful, but also the gray's main defensive weapon against killer whales. This one is in water so shallow that his entire pectoral fin is sticking out of the water, waving at us. This is crazy whale behavior. What are they doing? Up in British Columbia, some killer whales return to certain beaches to scratch themselves on the bottom. But they're rubbing on rounded stones. This area is part of the Snohomish River Delta. The bottom is sand and muddy sediment, so rubbing doesn't make sense. Maybe the soft sand is a good place for water yoga. Studying underwater behavior is always hard. If only we could ask the whales themselves to show us what they're up to down there. Thank you, technology. James Reddy's a tag that will collect data like depth, dive angle, and duration, plus video. New style tags are extremely safe for the animals. Instead of using old-fashioned metal barbs that pierce the whale's skin, this kind uses suction cups. The trick now is getting the tag onto the whale, especially in such snotty conditions. These devices are so light that they can be dropped onto the whales by drone. But with wind like today, it's better to deploy them by hand. One benefit of this crazy wind is that we're getting really good samples of what these whales smell like. And you don't want to be wearing it as cologne. There, John. James identifies the whale we're trying to tag as Thidwick, named after Dr. Seuss's Thidwick, the big-hearted moose. It's a fitting name, since a gray whale's heart can weigh nearly 300 pounds. The other whale with him is just known by his ID catalog number, 543. He's come back to the Salish Sea the last couple of years after not being seen for two decades. There must be something worthwhile here. And the fact that 543 came back 
might have something to do with the latest major mortality event. This is a delicate dance between whale, boat driver, and tiger. Oh yeah, tag is on! Fidwick feels a tiny tap on his shoulder, but that's it. It's like a ladybug landing on an elephant. All right, big boy, let's see what you're seeing. Cascadia's tags have piggybacked on whales for as long as 67 hours. They then simply pop off and signal to come find them floating at the surface. There's a lot more riding on Thidwick's back than just cool video footage. In the last nine years, an increasing number of gray and humpback whales have been found dead in the Salish Sea. This may just be a sad but natural result of the stunningly successful recovery of these animals. But we need to make sure that it's not that there's something amiss in our local estuaries. That's why Cascadia, Sea Dock, and other conservation partners are out here. One of the first whales to come this far into the Salish Sea is named Earhart, as in Amelia, the famously daring aviator. Earhart has come back here almost every spring since 1990. When Cascadia put a tag on her a few years ago, they were shocked to see that several gray whales who were first time visitors to the sound closely followed Earhart as she swam towards the beach. These rookies were smart enough to understand that Earhart would show them how to safely pilot their way into those dangerous shallows. John's studies show that Earhart and the other experienced sounders realize that they should only risk this maneuver when the tide is rising. As any boater or brilliant whale will tell you, if you're gonna hit the bottom, it's best to do it on an incoming tide. Run aground when the tide is dropping and you'll be left high and dry for a long time, which could be fatal for a whale. Another sounder founder is named for the Irish polar explorer and hero of the wreck of the endurance, Ernest Shackleton. Earhart and Shackleton have returned again and again for decades and love to buddy around. And here's where it gets really incredible. Since the sounders formed their small blubbery band, there have been three major gray whale die-offs. Based on the percentages alone, at least six of the 20 sounders should have died just during the most recent mortality event, and another six from the previous two. While one sounder hasn't shown up for a few years and might have passed away, the rest just keep on trucking. That's a 5% mortality rate over 33 years, compared to 50% for the general population. There is something going on around here that's obviously very good for the health of these whales. While we're peering underwater via the tags, another conservation partner, SR3, provides air support. Their drone captures photos that accurately measure a whale's body condition. The images show that the sounders are thin, often in poor condition when they enter the Salish Sea. That might be expected since they've already traveled thousands of miles from their breeding grounds but it could also mean that they're ailing. These guys don't look sickly at all. Follow-up photogrammetry shows that by the time they leave here, their body condition has improved. And we're almost certain that they're not stopping off at a local drugstore or visiting a veterinarian. So that leaves only one likely answer. Hannah jumps off the boat during a very low tide to dig deeper into the mystery and to confirm our theory. She and her team start poking around the spots where we saw the whales when this beach was covered in about 10 feet of water. The observations, tags, and photogrammetry have given us lots of clues. The sounders arrive here skinny, but by the time they leave, they've fattened up enough to continue their migration north of the Arctic. That means they've made this huge detour here to feed. And whatever it is that they're feeding on, it's here under the sand, in shallow water. But what lives around here in large enough numbers to fill up a 40-ton whale? Let's go back and look at some of those underwater selfies taken by the sounders. We can't see any schools of bottom-dwelling fish, but look at that sand being stirred up. Whatever it is they're eating, it lives underneath the sand and mud. A gray whale's primary method of capturing prey is called suction feeding. 
where they take in huge quantities of water and mud and sand and filter out the food with their bailing. And we're gonna mimic that technique by using our custom Sea Doc Society Super Suck. Yeah, baby. Munch, munch, munch. Spit out the sand. Munch, munch, munch. Spit out the sand. Munch, munch, munch. Spit out the sand. Munch, munch, munch. Ooh, 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 ooh. Check this out. Come on. Here, little buddy. Woo! This is a ghost shrimp. Okay, back to the gray whale selfie footage. There, that is a ghost shrimp. That one barely escaped the baleen, but it's certain that the whale gobbled up more than a few cocktails worth of his neighbors. The sounder gray whales are going way out of their way to spend spring break in the Salish Sea in order to gorge on our all-you-can-eat ghost shrimp buffet. These translucent little lobster-like critters are loaded with healthy fatty acids. As they go about their lives, these ghost shrimp stir up sediment, eat plants, poop nutrients, and even help to remove pollution from agriculture and other human runoff. That keeps all of us healthier. When a 50-foot whale takes a bite, it's a big one. So when they're chowing down on ghost shrimp, they make quite the impression, literally. These depressions aren't from a brontosaurus. They're from something even bigger the Snackosaurus, a hungry gray whale. The sounders excavate some 20,000 of these pits each season. This is a risky feeding strategy. That's why the rookie sounders look to the old pros like Earhart to show them how to swim safely on an incoming tide and then hightail it out of there before it drops. When the first big gray whale die-off began, Earhart and Shackleton were either smart enough or desperate enough to swim this far into the Salish Sea and find food. It saved their lives. They have now created their own sanctuary. As we work to continue recovering the Salish Sea, they're giving us an inspiring preview of what a truly healthy ecosystem can look like. shrimp jumbo, shrimp gumbo, and another shrimp for Jojo. <laughs> Eatos, shrimp, me eat those. <laughs> okay. One, one more time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These are all you can eat, right? That is all you can eat. <laughs>